We're back on the road this April with our live show, Cocaine Cowboys. If you want to hear the story of Ireland's love affair with Colombian powder and those who made millions in the gold rush, limited availability remains in Belfast at ulsterhall.co.uk. That's ulsterhall.co.uk. I would say, like, I don't think people outside journalism understand how much time these people live in our heads when we're investigating them. And it's like, you know, I think Michael Lynn has spent a long time in your head. But I was trying to work out in the book, have you got a clear understanding of the personality or do you still feel that you haven't got, you know, down to exactly what makes them tick? I'd like to think I have a pretty good understanding of of his personality that might be different from what makes him tick. Um, there have been a lot of conversations with him after the first time we caught up with him in, in, in early 2009. Um, you know, and, and he would get quite informal. He would ring up uh, out of the blue mm. over the years. Not frequently, right? It wouldn't be a weekly call. Yeah. The years would have passed at particular times when he wouldn't have been in touch at all. But he would ring up and he would shoot the breeze. He would often ring up to try and get a feel for what was going on back home in Ireland. Um, and in talking to someone over that period of, of years, I guess you learn something about their personality. But um, I mean, if you'd asked me to describe his personality, I would say that he is impulsive. Mm. Uh, but he's very, very clever. He's, you know, the guy has serious smarts. And mm. I think he's very good at, he's very good at, zoning in on whatever level the person he's talking to is at, right? He's like a politician in that sense. You mm-hmm. feel comfortable. Um, he's more intelligent than most people, I think. His mind churns very quickly. You could ask him for a telephone number of one of his bankers or brokers mm. and he'll remember it straight off the top from memory. You know what I mean? He was all over the details of all of his businesses um, and he's a very sharp, agile mind. Uh, maybe it spins a little bit too quickly and goes out of control sometimes. Is he always trying to work you for something? Like, you know, you said sometimes he'd ring if he's trying to get the feel of what it's like here. Sometimes I think he contacts you when he's feeling confident that he's beaten the system uh, over the course of those years. But does he always have a motive? I think there's always another agenda at play with people like Michael Lynn. Um, uh, you certainly wouldn't relax talking to him. You know, he's mm. after something. Um He's a salesman, you know, so he, he, his bread and butter was selling apartments to normal Irish people. He, he, he could very easily convince the average person to depart with 50,000 euro on a, on a place that hadn't been built yet. So people trust him. Yeah. You know, and he's charismatic in that way. Um, he's your classic fraudster personality, really, is what you're describing there. Yeah, if you talk to the guards who investigated him for years, like um, Paddy Linehan is now retired, but he, he led that investigation from start to finish. Paddy will describe him as your classic um, cocky uh, fraudster. Um, you know, comes across as confident, in control, um, believes in himself, mm. you know, believes his own spiel. Um, Is there anything sinister about him? I think he's capable of holding a grudge, if that's sinister. He's capable of um, waiting for revenge for a long time. I mean, I think the way he, I think from the moment he went on the run, he didn't blame himself for what happened. He blamed other people. Um, he felt he was part of a wider uh, corrupt system that was here at the time in the Celtic Tiger Island, which he alleged he paid bribes to bankers and whatnot. Uh, he wanted to bring down those people with him. Mm. And he said that right from the start. Uh, after our first initial interview, I met him privately in Budapest afterwards specifically to get the details of the bankers he said he'd bribed. And he named all the same names that he named 15 years later in court here. Uh, and every time I spoke to him in between, of course, the fault wasn't his, the fault was other people's. Mm. He admitted, was willing to, to admit making wrong decisions and being unethical about stuff. And But he never admitted he was a thief. And he wanted to throw the blame back on others. And he was willing to wait in the long grass for mm. many, many years. Uh, I mean, amazing survival skills he showed in Brazil 
when, and we will come through the story chronologically as well, but he's in Brazil before he's eventually extradited back to Ireland to face trial. And he's nearly four and a half years in a prison out there. I mean, he fought the extradition. So in a way, he kept himself in there. He'd later tell stories about that prison and the rats being bigger than the cats and all the, mm. the things he saw. I mean, we've no doubt some of those prisons are pretty inhumane places. Mm. And yet he survived four and a half years there and, and had some sort of a strength of character to do that or belief in himself that he shouldn't be extradited. Yeah, he's a very strong-willed, uh, forceful adaptable personality. So I think he could survive anywhere. Yeah. Right. He could, he could uh, whiz his way into a top level boardroom meeting of a Fortune 500 company and succeed. Or he could walk into a, a seedy bar in Bulgaria with a bunch of gangsters and succeed. Mm. Likewise, you can throw him into, into a horrible hellhole of a prison in Brazil, which was not nice. I mean, he, he's exaggerated some of the stories. Mm. Like the beheadings, for example. I'm not sure he actually witnessed the beheading as opposed to having been in the prison when a beheading or took heard place. Or heard of it or whatever. But um, yeah, he could survive anywhere, I think. the um, Some people like him who end up in the prison system find themselves to actually have a very useful position and, and they can be elevated in, in their importance within the system. Um, even Michaela McCullum, the drug mule, when she was in Peru, mm. she found herself being voted in as head of her wing because she had skills like literacy. Mm. She was able to speak to the prison authorities and able to represent the fellow, her fellow prisoners, work a budget for the food, that kind of thing. Um, do you get any sense that he became a, an important member of the prison community in Brazil? Well, the way that prison worked was that professional people like him were in a separate uh, section to the, to the normal prison. So they were slightly protected from from the craziness that went on elsewhere. So he definitely wouldn't have witnessed a beheading then. Well, who knows? I mean, he actually produced a document in at his sentencing, which was a psychiatric report. And while in the main trial, he had talked about having witnessed the beheading himself mm. and the psychological trauma he suffers of because of that. If you read the psychological report, it actually suggests that he watched the beheading on a mobile phone. Yeah. Which is a different thing. But yeah. Nevertheless, it's traumatic, I suppose, especially if maybe you share a prison with that person. Um, skills he might have used in prison to, to help himself. Yeah, I mean, he, he's, 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 a, he's a wheeler and dealer and negotiator. So he, he, he shared a cell with a, a Dutch cocaine smuggler called uh, Raymond Knobby, who calls himself Captain Coke. And um, together, those two would have bought bricks, for example, mm -hmm. um, to build a wall or partition to sort of try and protect them in their own cell from the others. So they were adaptable that way. Knobby, I understand would have forged a relationship with the governor of the prison who ran a car business on the outside. Knobby was a mechanic originally. So, right. you know, people like Lynn and, and his, his co soundmate there, they use the skills they have to, to eke out whatever advantage they can get. Criminals, of course, always like to hang out with lawyers usually. <laughs> I suppose. Uh, it helps yeah. their case. But I suppose to um, go back to who he was and what made him, I can't see anything in the background there that would have been a red flag. He's from a, a very ordinary sort of dairy farming family in Mayo, Cross Malina, is that right? Yeah, originally from Cross Malina. Um, his, his father was a dairy farmer. Um, he and the other kids would have worked hard at the farm. But there was one interesting insight I thought that came. It's not in the book, actually. It came too late to get into the book. And it was, again, the psychiatric report that was submitted for the sentencing. Mm. In that, the psychiatrist commissioned by Lynn's team um, spoke about how as a child his family and his parents are very austere and religious. So on the one hand they thought the value of hard work and kids weren't necessarily allowed lots of pleasures in their life. Um, but they also were never given presents. So as a child Lynn for his birthday and for Christmas was mm. never given any presents. So that combination, I don't know, psychologically I think that might have impacted on on his desire to uh, Feather his nest. Feather his nest or, or for shiny things or for yeah. you know, hard work and making money out of hard work mm. um, uh, when he grew up. But there was another thing in that report and I thought it was interesting. Two things actually. It spoke about how um, when he went to college in Trinity to do his first law degree, he had actually not really studied much. He'd gone to work instead to make money. And then he bought the notes from a classmate in order to pass the exam. Right. That's not 
necessarily corrupt, but it's an indication of someone who's willing to, to take a shortcut mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. achieve something. And it also spoke about how in one of his first jobs in a, a household name company that I won't name, um, he was an in-house lawyer there and he was responsible for paying off journalists with free holidays to oh. avoid negative publicity for that company. So that again was an introduction to how the world can work yeah. in not following yeah. Strictly ethical rules. Exactly. Right. So I think, I think it wasn't a far... There's certainly a few things there that, that would... Well, there was a willingness to step over the... to, to, to ignore the rules mm. um, to his own benefit. And then I think you can carry that on into, into moving into business and learning from colleagues and, and, and banking contacts how the shortcuts can be taken, how the privileged few, the sort of swizz he was at, wasn't available to you or I or most normal people. It was those in the know with the right relationships who were able to manipulate the system by lying and by being corrupt mm, to, mm. To, to, to earn themselves millions. And what a time, I suppose, to enter that system. We're talking the gold rush by 2003. Yeah. He is a solicitor, he's his practice, and he's starting to buy property. Yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, the spark met gasoline. Mm. You know, the, the Celtic Tiger was the spark, Lynn was the gasoline or vice versa. Um. Easy credit was everywhere. The banks were being reckless regardless of whether they were actually corrupt in his case or not. Uh, we all know that story. I'm not sure how much we want to go back into that part of our history, but um, he is a poster child of the Celtic Tiger. It, it made and broke him. Mm. Um, he may not have done as much damage were it not for that boom. I mean, So how many, he sort of had, he had an office in Mayo, one in Dublin. He didn't actually have an office in Dublin. No. Um, I mean, he had, a, he had a legal firm in Dublin. He had a, a property business called Kendar. Yeah. Um, was that set up in 2003? Uh, or it bought its first... That was set up in the early, in the, in the, in the mid-2000s. Right. Um, uh, he initially, expe- that, that initially developed a successful development in Portugal called Cabanish, which is, is close to Tavira on the Algarve. He built about 70 apartments there, which worked perfectly. Did very well, made a lot of money doing it. Yeah. And at that point, he realized that he couldn't get speculative loans from the banks in Europe. Uh, and he wanted to finance developments in Europe. He felt the property market and the money in the property market wasn't in Ireland because Ireland was, was, was crazy in Celtic Tiger years. Yeah. Um, he felt there was money to, to be made abroad, but he couldn't borrow abroad. So he, he, he committed uh, the thefts he's been convicted for in order to get money here from the banks under a false pretense to send it abroad to develop other projects in Hungary, um, in, in, in Bulgaria, in Slovakia, elsewhere in Portugal, etc. Um, and there was a way he was, he was illegally stealing here and churning that money into developments abroad, supposedly. That's so he was both solicitor and developer and uh, there was a kind of a situation that the banks trusted solicitors yeah, well, the, the, for those who don't know, the, the way he was able to, to steal the money that he stole was that at the time, in, in any property deal, a bank would trust a solicitor to sign an undertaking. And that undertaking would say that the money being lent is being lent against this property. And if there was a problem with the repayments, the bank had recourse to the property. And so the bank trusted the solicitor in the middle to do that. What Lynn was able to do, and a good example of this is Glen Lyon House in Hoth, which is a 5 million euro property. He was able to buy that house with a loan from one bank, uh, tell that bank he'd secured the house against against the loan, and repeat that process with four or five banks. But only one of those banks would really have recourse back to the actual deeds of the house. So the other three could never, ever get their money back. Mm-hmm. Now, Lynn would say that he always intended to pay that money back. Um, and that house in Hoth was essentially his family home. He was married at the time to Breed Murphy. <laughs> It was billed as his family home. It, yeah. It was, uh, it was billed as their dream home. They never actually lived there. Right. Um, everything blew up before they moved into that house. If indeed they ever intended to move into that house. But yeah. it was certainly billed as, as his, his uh, palatial trophy home out on the coast. She's an interesting character in the story, Breed. Mm. His, his wife, she stuck by him through thick and thin. Um, and even up until this most recent, just before Christmas, when he was convicted and sent to jail for four and a half years, yeah. which four years, four years. Yeah, well, the headline sentence, the headline sentence, sentence was actually 16 yeah. years and a bit. Um, 
he was given time off because of the 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 time he'd spent in prison in Brazil, which mm. was four and a half years. The conditions there were so bad that Lynn used a, a German court ruling that another cellmate of his, Paul Lange, had actually successfully used. Lange was extradited before Lynn was ever extradited. And the German courts allowed him two and a half days for every day he spent in, in prison with Lynn. Right. So Lynn used that as used a, that when he came back mm-hmm. here and he got seven years, seven and a bit years off, the 16 mm. years for that. He will serve uh, four, four and a half years after remission here in prison. What strikes me is it was such a small period of time, really. You know, it was where the damage was done, I suppose, um, between about 2003 to 2007. Well, the crimes he's been he's been convicted of all took place in less than a year. Less than a year, right? Mm. Um, between uh, and his conviction relates to eighteen million. He was convicted of stealing eighteen million euro. Um, he was on trial for stealing twenty seven million from uh, from the various banks. It's an interesting story if you want me to go into it. How two of those banks, those convictions weren't upheld by the jury, Bank of Ireland and Irish Nationwide. Um, so there were 18 convictions at the end of the day, you know, 11 or, or something like that where he wasn't convicted on those. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Lynn has some... Is this due to his claims that the bankers were taking backhanders from him and... It, 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 partly. I mean, Irish Nationwide is an interesting case. 11 of the charges were involved Irish Nationwide. Um, only one of those charges was successful. Uh and that is probably because the jury did believe that Michael Fingleton is the chief executive of Irish Nationwide, the worst bank in Celtic Tiger Ireland that cost all of us more than any other bank. Um, the jury believed that it was possible that Fingleton was 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 corrupt and engaged in some sort of uh, scam with Lynn. Now, Fingleton could never be produced at the court because Fing- of Fing- medical reasons. Fingleton is sick now. Um, he hasn't he hasn't been able to testify. Um, but the, the court was shown, for example, the power he had in Irish Nationwide, including a, a board resolution going back years before the Celtic Tiger even that gave him complete power to do anything he wanted. So if Fingleton wanted to give you or I a loan at the time um, in return for a kickback, he actually could have done it mm. under the rules that the board had, had, had sanctioned him. So the 18 million it relates to what he was actually convicted of. It started with 27 million and he was found not guilty of some of those charges. Mm. But what so we we start with eighty million that he borrows eighty million. So where does the rest of it, that? It, it go? wasn't actually was found not guilty. It's that the jury couldn't decide on. They the couldn't charges, decide. Okay. Right? Um, when he first ran away, I mean, the, the, one of the sad things about the Michael Lynn story is that it's much bigger than what we've seen in court this year. Um, when he first ran away at the end of two thousand and seven, there was eighty eight zero million missing from various Irish banks. Not all of those resulted in in charges, but the real saddest part of this is that. Hundreds of people up and down the country had spent 13 million on apartments that he'd promised to build for them in mm-hmm. various places in Europe. Most of those people lost all of their money. That would have been probably their pension money. It and was their, their life savings, their yeah. pension money, various windfalls. There's a, there's a case outlined in the book of Sean O'Mahony, a publican from County Kerry, and that's a very, very sad case because Sean's wife, Kathleen, worked for the Department of Justice. She did the payroll for the guards. Right. Um, she... She got cancer and she she left her job with a payoff to see out her days. She got about 50 grand. Um, she decided to buy a legacy for their two daughters. Their daughters were young kids at the time. And that legacy was a, an apartment that Lynn was supposed to build in Bansko, a ski resort in, in Bulgaria. Mm. They gave him the money. And uh, shortly afterwards, uh, Kathleen was in her hospital bed and she asked her husband to put on the news. Six o'clock news on RTE. He did that. And Lynn at the time was on the news. He was the, the top of the news because he was just before he went on the run, he was coming out of court. There were yeah. images of him and his wife coming out of court. And before the news um, was finished, Kathleen had a heart attack and died in her bed. Right. right. They lost all that money. They and uh, dozens of others made criminal complaints to the Gardaí. And the Gardaí investigated those the DPP decided not to prosecute. There wasn't enough evidence because the money had gone abroad. And the guards couldn't necessarily follow it that easily. They mm. did recommend that the authorities abroad might have an interest in in pursuing that. But of course, it all fell between the cracks. Mm. And uh, the real victims of of Michael Lynn are people like that. Ordinary people. Ordinary people who yeah. lost their life savings. And uh, if any of them hear this and want to come forward, I'd love to talk to more of them because mm. um, we, we will be doing a documentary about this for, for RT in the future. 
And I think I'd love to hear more real stories from real people who lost out because... And that sort of his interactions with those real people and his ability to steal from them shows us something a little more sinister to his personality because like a lot of people hate the banks and yeah. the bankers and, you know, why don't you go after them and the crooks and the doll and all the rest of it. Yeah. But these are people, not institutions, and it's easier to see the effects of that loss to them. 100%. I mean, these are people that Lynn or one of his salespeople looked in the eye, uh, you know, and mm. made a pitch to, and they trusted him with their money. Um, one of them actually, uh, one of them actually was Pat Kenny. Um, yeah. He, I've recently done a, an interview with Pat Kenny and Pat Kenny was telling me how Lynn appeared on the Late Late Show to give away a, a 100,000 euro apartment in Vansco right, as a yeah. prize. It was the most expensive prize ever done. But after the show, he tried to sell Pat Kenny an apartment. Right. You know, he was just... He just couldn't help himself. <laughs> You'd wonder, so at that stage, so he's he has... Um, borrowed 80 million from the banks. He's investing in various properties abroad, but he's also stealing from the little people. And is he in some sort of a, is that, is the scam what is motivating him or the addiction? Or is that because he has some sort of a pyramid scheme going and he's he needs more money to, to pay off some debts or what's happening then? I think it churned into becoming a kind of a pyramid scheme, especially when things started to to go bad for him. Um, but I think it, it, the question of his motivation is interesting. I mean, he's not a character who is overtly flashy, right? Money per se, as a commodity, doesn't seem to have interested him. He didn't wear flashy suits. He drove didn't. nice cars when he came, you know, when you spotted him when you were away. It wasn't that nice. I mean, there were, there were Audis, coupes mm. and things, but you know, he wasn't driving Ferraris or Porsches. Mm. Um, he they was, always seemed to live in nice houses though. And Well, that is true. I mean, they had nice villas and, and they had a comfortable life and yeah, the, the fruits of, of, of the money he could, he had access to, you know, allowed him and, and, and Breed to, uh, to have a box in, you know, various stadiums and go and see matches with in corporate lounges and stadiums where they would go to concerts every week with 10 or 12 guests. I mean, it wasn't living a poor life, but at mm. the same time, I'm not sure it was, it was, um, it was money per se he was after. I think it was a buzz. I think he was addicted. He was a gambler, mm. addicted to the buzz of the next win. And it wasn't so much the paper money after the win. It was, it was the buzz of doing the thing, you know, He's, he has spoken about. And sometimes those scams, you know, it's, you know, you talked about him being really intelligent and, you know, he's probably operating on a slightly higher level than most people. But sometimes those scams is just getting one over on an individual. Did he enjoy that? M maybe, you know, maybe. I think he enjoyed being in a privileged set of people who were able to perpetrate those shortcuts, those scams, that corruption mm. that the rest of us didn't have access to, you know. I think he felt privileged in that world. Um, he does think big of himself. He does have a big ego, you know. Um, Is he sort of narcissistic? He's completely narcissistic. Um, he, uh, he, you know, I can remember when we first met him and he agreed to the interview, he was in a football shirt. Yeah. Right. And he didn't want to be seen publicly in a football shirt for the photographs that we agreed to. So... I lent him my shirt at the time that I'd bought going through the airport on the way out. Right. So that sort of silly narcissism that shouldn't matter. Yeah. Was yeah. something he worried about. Bigger issues you would have thought than his shirt at that stage. So talk about that. So Lynn is before, he's brought before the High Court to answer certain questions that sort of, um, one of his own staff, I think, makes a complaint to the Law Society. Is that how it kicks off initially? Yeah. So around about September 2007, Fiona McAleenan, who was... Uh, the senior lawyer in his Dublin practice. Um, she talks about, she gave evidence about a, a fax coming in from Makiva Ronan, I think, who were Ulster Bank's solicitors at the time. And that fax was asking about a list of, of, of 10 or so properties. Um, she says she realized when she saw that list that she'd seen the same list against another bank's loan. And she realized something was wrong and she approached um, the Law Society after that and blew the whistle. Um, she is someone who Lynn, you asked me earlier if he's capable of revenge, of revenge and stuff like that. She's certainly someone. He blames. He, he blames and he would have no love for. Um, and I think he he tried in the trial to drag her down as much as he could mm. by presenting all sorts of uh, 
information to show that she, you know, how, how complicit he alleges she was in what was going on. Now, she's not complicit in what was going on, but she was an important participant uh, in how things worked in that office because when those dodgy loans that he was getting were going on, Lynn wasn't in the office. He was actually abroad most of the time, but he required people like Fiona to sign the loan documents. Mm. Otherwise, the banks wouldn't have accepted the, the paperwork at all. So Fiona McAleen and, and Lynn's PA at the time, uh, Liz Doyle, they signed the paperwork. Liz, in her case, forged the signatures more often than not. Those documents still needed a solicitor's undertaking to promise the bank that it would have recourse to the loan. Um, Fiona signed those, but she told the court that she didn't know what she was signing. She didn't look at what she was signing, which is not, mm. it's not um, proper behavior for a solicitor. She says that that's the way things were everywhere. I noticed that woman had seven children, which is... She had seven kids, yeah. She's you know, a remarkable you know, woman in that sense yeah. um, and maintained a professional life throughout, yeah. But isn't that uh, the nature of the narcissist when somebody goes up against them? They, you know, they can't have a neutral attitude to them. They are the enemy, you know. You're with them or you're against them. You're with them or against them, yeah. I guess there is a bit of that about, about Michael Lynn. Uh, at the same time, I think he's cute enough to keep his enemies close. Mm. And he's cute enough to speak to you. Um, to speak, I mean, you know, I think he was keeping his enemy close by speaking to me over the years in many ways. Um, Trying to sort of not manipulate the narrative, but certainly stay in it. Stay in it. And, you know, you get to a certain point, I guess, where he's talked to me so much that he knows I know more than I should know. Mm. You know, so you have to nearly stay on board with yeah. me. Otherwise... You know, he, he might be fearful of where I might go with the, the information I have. So he was due before the High Court in Dublin and he was kind of trying to publicly um, reassure people that he was going to fix all this and he was going to get it all settled out and he disappears. Yeah, in October 2007, in, de in December 2007, he was, he was due to come before the court to explain what was happening, um, why the Law Society had discovered a crazy... Um, the inadequacies uh, in client funds, in his law practice, etc. Um, he had promised that he'd come to court and explain, could explain away everything. There was a, a famous day at the beginning of December when he, he was due in court. Everybody was waiting in court. There were a hundred lawyers from different banks there. Every journalist in town was there. Um, and he didn't show up. Mm. Instead, he stepped on a, he stepped in a taxi, ran to the airport, took a plane and disappeared. Right. And it didn't take long for everyone to realise that. I mean, that was the first, that was the canary in the coal mine of the Celtic Tiger, if you like. Mm. Back when that happened, we didn't know all the stuff that subsequently happened with the banks collapsing and, you know, yeah. the, the Sean Fitzpatrick. All that was to films. come. All that was to come. Mm. Um, Lynn's, Lynn's uh, running away um, and the mess he left behind was the first inkling we had that... Uh, the banking system here could be in real, real trouble. So it quickly spiralled after that. And at that point when he goes missing, um, his wife Breed is left here in Ireland to sort of answer some, semi answer some questions. And she says she hasn't heard from him in a few days, but expects to. Yeah, but she was interesting because she, she, she spoke freely when she was in court as he was on the run about travelling to meet him abroad. She knew where he was. They were in touch. Mm. Um, uh, and I'm not, you know, I think she was playing, uh, she was loyal to her husband, but at the same time. How long were they married then at this stage? She, so he would have been in his mid-30s, would he, in uh, 2007? I guess he would have been, he's 55 now. My maths ain't great. But, Nor uh, mine. Um, they married, mid to late 30s, I'd say. They married in 2006, so they were newly enough married Okay. when this all went down. Was that a flash wedding? It was a flash wedding in Ashford Castle. Um, a, lot of money, <laughs> a lot of money spent on that. Yeah. Um, she was a uh, breed. Was uh, uh, she was head of the um, the um, emergency unit in Vincent's. You know, she had her own career, mm. not a high earning career. Her salary was about forty grand. Um, they had met previously, a couple of years or a year or two before they actually got together and married, and then there was a gap, and they met again, and um, and they married uh, about a year, let's say, before. Uh, all of this happened. Mm. So does she join him in Portugal? Yeah, um, she joined him in Portugal. She moved around with him. Um, 
as we were trying to get in front of him, we were being sent photographs of him with her in various different locations in Budapest and 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 elsewhere. Um, they were very much together. She was very much part of his life uh, while on the run. He has spoken. Um, he has spoken to me about a point at which he he asked her to leave him because you know life was was uh, was wasn't going well for him. Um, but she stuck by him, and you know she I'm sure was a great support to him. When you look at them, when you look at them in court together or anywhere together, they are clearly two people in love. Right? Mm. It's not a fake love story. Um, they clearly do rely on each other and they they support each other very much. But she plays a practical role as well, I think, in his affairs. Um, when he was stealing the money he was stealing, there were occasions when those loans were being taken out in names of a company that she was also a part owner of. Nobody ever pursued her. The guys didn't made a choice not to pursue her for that. They pursued only him. Um, when Lynn was on the run, we could see how he was selling off his European assets, putting them out of reach of creditors. Um, her name features on the paperwork for some of those companies around Europe um, to this day. Mm. And the current Garda money laundering investigation that um, that the Garda launched during his retrial uh, is actively investigating her role in the money trails going back to then, back to zero. 809 when he was around the run mm -hmm. moving his money around they're, they're, they're investigating whether that's the same money or is connected in any way to the funds that have now wound up back in Ireland buying a house in Wicklow that Breed and, and um, Lynn and his family lived in uh, during his retrial uh, that house is owned by uh, a company which is being run by a Bulgarian associate um, Yavor Poptashev is his name he's been in court uh, and he's been named in court. Um, uh, he is running a company that bought that house for uh, 450,000 euro uh, around about a year ago, mm. a year and a half ago. Um, Poptashev is also a director of or an owner of three or four other brand new Irish companies that are engaging in the property business here. Um, so the Guardian are very interested to understand where the money has come from for those firms. One of them got planning permission for uh, dozens of apartments in Clonshock, but then flipped the deal and sold it on to another firm that's now building it out that has nothing to do with any of this. And Lynn was actively helping and working with those firms back in the property business, not as a formal employee because he, he was still on trial, mm. but he was actively um, overseeing lots of that work. Uh, and the courts have been told that in a letter from a UK individual called John Halloran, who has, uh, during Lynn's um, um, uh, sentencing hearing, Halloran wrote to the court to say that he had offered Lynn a job um, to manage various businesses that he wanted to run through Ireland. Uh, if you like, it's, 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 uh, it's an alternative explanation for why Lynn was back in the property game. But the guards want to know the truth about what he was doing, how he got the money to do it, um, and what access he had to the funds that went missing when Lynn went on the run 15 years ago. And I think they're quite a way down that that trail. I mean, we have... Like Bulgaria is hugely significant. You first tracked down Lynn to Portugal. We met him first in Portugal, yes. Yeah. Uh, not prearranged. <laughs> You kind of had to stalk him a little bit before you... Yeah, well, I mean, I was tasked by, by my newspaper, The Mail on Sunday, to um, to go and find him at the end of, at the beginning of 2008. Uh, in those early years, Lynn wasn't exactly hiding. He wasn't criminally charged with anything. Mm. Just couldn't come back to Ireland because he would be arrested um, if he came back on... on, on, on a, had the criminal investigation launched then? Of course it had, yes. Yeah. He was being yeah. investigated for alleged crimes at the time. He was also being investigated by the Law Society and the Director of Corporate Enforcement. Um, he just sort of upsticked, sticks moved to Portugal and continued doing what he was doing. He, he upsticks moved to Portugal, flitted around between Portugal, Bulgaria, Hungary, Slovakia, all places he had big property businesses in. Um, and what he was doing was moving his money out of reach of anyone who could come after him, right? Mm. And you asked me about meeting him that first time. It was nice to get that meeting, and we can talk about that in a second if you like, but the hunt to get to that meeting 
which took more than a year, actually uncovered a lot of the very interesting parts of this story. You know, that hunt showed us um, how he was moving those assets, often a week or two just ahead of us. Um, At one point you picked up some documents which had been sort of abandoned outside an office he was using and you'd seen him in a car yeah. probably pull in and drive off. And I mean, those documents form part of the information in this book. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you, you take what you can get. And I was sitting in a car with... It's okay to write in the bins. It's grand. We've all done it. Well, I, I, I'm i sitting in a car with uh, my photographer, Sean Dwyer, and it was dark. So if Lynn showed up, we wouldn't get a picture. And that was our primary goal yeah. before we, we tried to speak to him. But this car did show up that we knew Lynn to be driving. It showed up outside his his Algarve HQ. Um, the then manager of, of his Portuguese property business was in the car. Uh, well, it was in the office and came out to the car and documents were passing to and fro through the window. Um, they were being torn up by whoever was in the car. We thought it was Lynn, but we, we couldn't be sure. And uh, given back to to the manager who was putting them into a plastic bag. And when the car sped away, the manager just dumped the plastic bag beside the recycling bin. Frustration uh, or carelessness? Uh, I think he just, you know, he just didn't have a care in the world. I don't think he certainly mm-hmm. didn't know there was any risk of, of those documents being found. But they were an early indication to us I remember sitting in my hotel room that night, piecing together all of those those documents. And, uh, you know, this was a time when Lynn's accounts had all been frozen by court order here. Yet these documents were showing bank transfers worth millions that he'd been engaged in while on the run. Yeah. They were showing how his, uh, his Portuguese business had been renamed secretly. And from one night to the next, the sign Kendar had disappeared from, from the office. And there was a new sign up called Vantea. And Vantea was a new company owned by anonymous people that you couldn't trace back to Lynn. The website for Vantea had been set up before Lynn went on the run. and it It's very was, sophisticated at that point. Well, I don't know. Um, I guess uh, he had good advisors. He had the money to pay for advice. Um, I don't know how sophisticated it was to be, to be leaving stuff out in the ground like that. That bit of it um, isn't, of course, but... Ever heard of a shredder? Your man in the office manager. So I'm wondering, was he was he fed up of him, or was he just being careless that day? But was it those documents that led you onwards to Bulgaria? Um, partly, but not necessarily. I mean, my my job is just about my job is just about establishing basic facts, and people think it's all very exciting and based on police sources and whatnot. Maybe your work is, but in in in, in my world, it's more about um, following the trails that people have to leave when they engage in formal businesses, mm. right? Um, people have to leave land registry records, company records, lawyers records, all of that stuff. Um, abroad in Europe, it's harder to follow than over here. So the reason we were in, in Bulgaria, to answer your question, is that Lynn uh, had developments planned in Bulgaria. We knew that. So it was a question of going there. And some of these he'd sold to the people back home here. We were buying apartments? Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. I spoke about Sean Amani earlier, I think. And uh, one of those apartments in Bulgaria was the apartment that his wife had bought. To this day, and I visited that site back then, and I've checked it out again recently. To this day, that site was supposed to be 300 ski apartments, is an empty lot with weeds growing up through the cracks, through the bare soil. Nothing was ever built there. Um. So the reason to go to Bulgaria was just to chase down those lands and see what had happened to them. Um. It's it's a fairly basic, boring job, but in doing that, you you, you always find different leads and, and stuff pops up that, that becomes interesting. So one of the most interesting aspects of Bulgaria was a, a Black Sea site um, close to a city called Varna, where Lynn had bought a, a huge tract of land right on the, on, the, on the sea. It was a nature reserve that had never been developed. Um, and interestingly, he had bought that the record showed from uh, a bunch of crooks, a mafia organization over there run by a, a dangerous Chechen overlord. Um, so how did he get into that company? It's quite simple, really. Uh, it was an opportunity presented to Lynn back in Dublin in 2006 before he ever went on the run. Um, the, 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 the time he gave away the apartment on the Late Late Show mm. was the Friday before a big property exhibition started in the RDS at the time. And um, at that property exhibition, there was a Chechen living in Dublin who was a go-between to the Chechens over in Bulgaria. And he presented Lynn with a ready-made deal. 
Mm. Um, thankfully for me, the deal was was on paper, um, and it was an investment opportunity that involved this land in the Black Sea. Lynn could buy it for 1.6 million because the mafia figures over in Bulgaria had strong armed lots of local farmers to sell their land for a pittance. Um, and they packaged it together, put the proposal to Lynn that if he bought this, they could secure planning permission because an important figure in the local council was on the books and in return for a payment of 30 grand, Lynn could be assured that he'd get planning permission on what was then a, um, a nature reserve. Um, and that's how Lynn got into bed with mm. you know, some pretty dangerous criminals involved in all sorts of stuff over in Bulgaria. Did that excite him? I think it might have. Um, he has spoken to me excitedly about meeting these guys in, in white suits and bulletproof vests with weapons when he went over to Bulgaria. I think it was the storytelling part of him liked that drama. Yeah, I think he likes a bit of drama. Yeah. Um, Is he losing a little bit of touch with reality at that point? Does he think he's in a movie? Yeah, that's an interesting point. He, he, he often speaks about how his life should be made into a movie. Um, for years, he would, you know, joke about doing a Netflix together because he thought his life was that interesting. And, and it is that interesting, it but is, maybe it's yeah. not for him to say. Yeah, maybe, exactly. You know? um, yeah, I, but it all comes back, I think, to just opportunities to make money and uh, being perfectly willing to step over the line into, into criminality to make money. And knowing full and being able to deal with anybody, be they legitimate or none. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that aspect of that personality yeah. allows those doors open for him. Somebody else would just not be able to do business. They'd smell it off those guys, you know. Yes, anyone with uh, any sense probably or morals or or, mor or morals, yeah, um, wouldn't go near people like that. But Lynn didn't care if there was money to be made, he'd do it, and he was happy to deal with those guys. and And he stood up to them, you know. Mm. He wasn't a, a willowing. Um, you know, uh, there was a time when, when uh, yeah, yeah, Hashiev is the name of that particular crook in Bulgaria. He was, when he wanted more money from Lynn and he was starting to make threats to uh, to Lynn's team. I don't know if I can use the phrase or, or not, but there's a great phrase about how um, if a camel has sex and a fly dies, you know, they don't care. It's the sort of typical Bulgarian yeah. insult that they threw around. And Lynn stood up to your man and said, look, you know, if you threaten my staff, you threaten me. Right. You know, so he was... He was feeling very cocky then. He certainly was, yeah. Yeah. So the process of justice is pretty slow. And as we've seen in the past, and particularly in that era, those uh, guardy investigating financial crimes has been trudging. Um, you know, there's a lot of people would say they weren't given the resources. Some, some, sometimes the... Do you need outside people to be able to be brought in there with a more sort of powerful position in an investigation? But it moved very slowly nonetheless. I mean, listen, the guards, the guards at the time, the fraud squad at the time as it was, uh, you may know better than me, but uh, it, it was tiny. Mm. It wasn't resourced. It's probably, it's still not resourced like it should be compared to other jurisdictions. I don't think we, we put enough focus at all on white collar crime in this country. Um, one of the things I do to show myself what's possible is I, I'm on an old FBI press list and every morning these releases come in from the FBI, white collar crime releases. Yeah. Another, every day there's 20, 30 emails about fantastic uh, white collar prosecutions about stuff that I'm sure is happening here mm. that we're not investigating, we're not cracking down on, we're not finding. And when we do, we're often failing to prosecute properly. Um, so I think the guards... Back then, whatever about now, um, really stood little chance in investigating this properly, especially, especially when the Celtic Tiger happened. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, so quickly after Lynn left, the Celtic Tiger imploded. There were big, big investigations like, you know, into Anglo and others um, that completely swallowed any small resources the guards had. Um, I think there were very good individual guardie uh, who did their best. Uh, and without their work, Lynn wouldn't have been prosecuted and they stayed with that case. Uh, you know, all the way. I think they should be commended, but I don't think they ever got the support that they needed from above, probably right up to government level. Um, and I don't think, to be frank with you, we even would have got Lynn back. He may well have easily gotten away with this if we didn't have somebody like Alan Chatter mm. as Justice Minister at the time. You know, um, 
Shatter was a lawyer himself, of course, and he particularly despised what Lane had done to the reputation of, of the legal community. So Shatter, virtually off his own bat, ensured that the cabinet made a decision to, um, to do a new extradition deal with, with Brazil, to have mm. a reciprocal extradition deal that we would give them somebody, somebody behind bars here if, if we got someone in return and we knew who we wanted in return. Without Shatter in place, Lane may well have easily gotten away with this and could still be living in Brazil. Mm. You know, there wasn't a he huge... made another fortune, perhaps, or stolen one. Yes. Because he was back. And of course, it was around 2011, 2012, he goes to Brazil because there's an extradition he wanted at that point in Ireland. Yeah, well, that's telling. I mean, first of all, even before he went on the run in 2007, he had laid the plans to go to Brazil. Mm. So his first trip to Brazil was in January 2007. He didn't go on the run until December. But of course, he was actively fleecing the banks. We just didn't know it at the time. So during that first trip, he, he laid plans for, for how to live in Brazil. Uh, he, he had meetings with lawyers where he discussed what he needed to do to establish a company there, to send his money over there, how he could, could become a resident of Brazil. You know, and all those plans were laid before he ever went on the run. Um, he didn't ultimately go to live in Brazil until after around 2011, stroke 2012. Um, just before criminal charges were finally laid against him. Yeah. And then he became a formal fugitive, if you like, really yeah. only one from the law. Um, it was a, a warrant out for his arrest at that point. They, yes. He read Interpol notices that is when people are to be arrested on site and the blue one is when they're... That's my understanding of it, yeah. For most of his time on the run, um, he was only subject to a blue notice. So the guards here would be informed every time he crossed the border yeah. of where he was, but until criminal charges were laid against him, he wasn't going to be arrested. Yes, they're just and, collating him and keeping intelligence open yeah. on him. So in Brazil, uh, and Breed joins him in Brazil, mm. and what they'd later use, or she would claim in court, was that the reason they were there is to for IVF treatment because they couldn't have children. Mm. Um, but he settles down out there, he gets a job teaching, and uh, there's a Ferrari back home here, He's wanted. Where is he? But nonetheless, they 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 make a new life for themselves, and, and he starts to dabble in the property business again. He was set up again. You know, he had he had he had done a few years in Europe, and as he told the court here during his recent trial, he'd had enough of trying to make a go of it in Europe. He couldn't succeed because of the legacy that followed him, and because of what he'd done. So, whatever money he managed to siphon away, as we discussed earlier was clearly available to him when he went to Brazil because he was able to set up a number of companies there. He was able to buy a new development site. He was able to secure planning. He was back in business as if nothing had ever happened, you mm. know. Um, that was thanks in large part to the birth of his first son in 2011. And you're right, there is a, a narrative that Lynn has pr presented here that um, the reason for going to Brazil wasn't to avoid extradition or being caught. The reason was because uh, they had struggled for many years to have children and they were recommended a specialist in Sao Paulo who succeeded in helping and they had their first child in 2011. At the point that that happened, Lynn began to gleefully tweet. Um, That's an extraordinary bit of it when he goes on social media. He goes on social confidence media. Confidence of him. Yeah, yeah. He's, 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 he thinks he's a free man at that point. You know, he doesn't think he can be touched. Um, he also gives an interview to uh, Elio Moloko, uh, who's another mm. slightly untoward solicitor um, who, who, who Lynn engaged with occasionally. And uh, Moloko ran a small magazine for a while that didn't last long. But again, this, this gleeful, gloating interview ran with Lynn that he was high and dry in Brazil now and the authorities couldn't get him and would never get him, etc. And given they had had the child, the child had been born in that country, the child was a resident and they would follow on to get residency status. Because of that child, they had full residency status. Um, what Lynn didn't know was that Brazil was preparing to host the Olympics and the World Cup. And Brazil was a bit sick and tired of the reputation it had in the international community for being a haven for crooks and criminals. So Brazil actively were trying to clamp down on that. And there were various notorious crooks from different countries who had actually been extradited um, because Brazil had made it known in the diplomatic circuit that it was willing to do reciprocal deals in order to to lose this reputation in advance of those tournaments. And Lynn was one of the cases that um, that fell into that category. Yeah. I mean, that's funny. 
you should mention that because there was a similar expectation from Dubai with Expo. Right. Yeah, that they were going to clean up their act. They didn't want to look as if they were a haven for okay. drug dealers, uh, international drug dealers. And they did indeed give a couple of significant characters back to the Netherlands. We didn't get our own yet, but we we await. Um, so he, unknown to him in his confidence and he's tweeting away and he's happy out, given his interview, child uh, born, one on the way. He's all the while under surveillance and about to be lifted. Yeah, the, the deal has been done in secret. Not even the fraud squad here knew the deal had been done. Um, as soon as it was it was passed through the, the Supreme Court in Brazil, the federal police over in Recife had been watching him. They were they were carrying out surveillance of his coming and goings um, in preparation for an arrest. Lynn had no idea. He was he was you know he was going for walks every morning on the beach with his dogs. He was going in and out to the English school. He was doing his normal business. Um, there was a moment when he went out to a shopping centre without Breed and that's when the police pounced. Breed was pregnant at the time and visibly heavily pregnant so I don't think they wanted to mm. to cause her any stress. Um, he was arrested in a nearby shopping centre and brought back to the gate of his, his compound because he asked if he could say goodbye to his son. His, you know, the son was one or something at this time. Um, so they did bring him back and uh, he was allowed to say goodbye to his son then they whisked him off to to prison where he stayed for the next four and a half years. Mm. Breed was pregnant at the time, so that child was born. Shortly afterwards, they had two subsequent children due to conjugal visits, which were allowed in prison. Um, and I think he felt that every subsequent Brazilian child increased his chances of being able to stay in Brazil. Did he use that as his argument in court to, for the Brazilians not to allow the Irish extradite him? He, he did. He repeatedly used that. And the more children he had, the more he tried yeah. to use it. But uh, none of it worked at the end. At the, at the end, but a long battle he fought and her going in and out of prison to see him. I mean, that no matter what, that must have been hard times for her to be there on her own, very far away from family, yeah, husband in yeah, prison. Yeah, I think I think it says something about her. I think she's a pretty tough cookie. Um, I've, I've stood outside that prison at five in the morning when the all the wives and girlfriends come in their horrible squalid conditions with, you know, open sewage flowing down the street and dogs running around. It's third world conditions mm. in that area. Um, they queue up overnight to be allowed in to see their 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 husbands and boyfriends. And I've watched Breed, you know, join that queue, tough as a cookie, pregnant, heavily pregnant, right? And um, you know, uh, and go in to see Michael. So yeah, she's she's. I'm sure she's very tough inside. Mm. Uh, she's very softly spoken. Um, she testified in the initial trial in in 2023, but not in the retrial. And she was very softly spoken when she speaks. She comes across as being timid, etc. But um, they're a team. Yeah, I think they are a, a very strong team. Mm. And I think together they they probably feel they're unbeatable, and they probably feel they can be cuter and more clever than anybody else, and actually mm. get away with with what they're doing. Um, up to he the must have felt uh, a sense of victory when he got the hung jury in the first trial. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Um, he convinced at least three members of the jury. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he, he did. And look, what turned that trial, um, that trial began in February and finished in June, right? It was a crazy long, horribly technical, utterly boring. <laughs> and he has free legal aid? Trial, and he was on free legal aid. Um, and what changed that trial was his testimony at the very end of it. So he, he played along as if nothing was yes. strange about the scenario throwing in all sorts of silly defences until the very end. And what turned that was his testimony after the jury had been bored silly for months. Right. Right. And had virtually lost interest. He stood up on the on the on the stand to give his own evidence against the advice of his own team. He gave evidence for the guts of a week. Um and I think he completely enthralled the jury with his story and I think they believed him. And he threw everyone under the bus. And he threw everyone under the bus, of course, as well, yeah. All the bankers named everybody. He said he was giving them free holidays and kickbacks. And he, he, he told all these stories that he had initially told me, you know, more than a decade earlier, in which yeah. I was very interested in hearing a decade earlier, because if it was true, mm. and if I could prove that bankers were being bribed as a journalist, I certainly want to do that. And I did chase down some of those names here, but I never was able to prove any of it. Mm. Um, but... Fast forward to his trial, he threw all of those names under the bus. He named, 
individual bankers from each of the banks who he said he paid cash to. He gave them free holidays in return for loans. They were offered 30% off apartments, all that stuff. Of course, every single one of those bankers, when they were called in as rebuttal witnesses, denied everything. And there was no proof. Lynn has never produced any proof. Much and all as I'd like to see it as a journalist. You know, I'd love to, I'd love to expose no, one receipt. no records to prove anything. Mm. Um, now, we spoke a little earlier about how Irish Nationwide and Bank of Ireland, those charges didn't succeed. The, the reason why the Bank of Ireland one didn't succeed, I think, is interesting. Um, in his retrial, Lynn had a little bit of a fight back where he obtained um, internal records from the bank. And he was able to successfully show that Bank of Ireland knew in 2004, long before any of this ever happened, that he was giving false undertakings for loans and not doing the paperwork properly. But he, mm. he was able to turn it and pay it back without being discovered. And he was also able to show that with internal records from the bank itself, right, that they knew way before this ever became public, number one, number two, that after he went on the run and they lost all the money, they were able to claim the money back through their insurance policy. Right. So they actually lost nothing. Right. In the case of Bank of Ireland, right? Right. And that's why that charge didn't stick. Right. But he never proved any of the corruption he, he alleged. Breed didn't give evidence in the second trial. No. She did in the first. Yeah. But you witnessed a little bit of skullduggery by the two involving a bottle of water one day. She, she wants to oh, hand him well, a bottle of water. He certainly wants the jury to see... She, yeah, look, I thought... Yeah. The family. I mean, it was... It was even clear in the first trial that it was a deliberate tactic to bring in Breed only at the last minute to, to try and play on the emotions of, of the family man, Lynn the family man. So his evidence on the trial uh, at the very end of the first trial was the first time that she showed up. And I remember even in the first trial them making a fuss to make sure that Breed was sort of, they were seen together, you know. Until she showed up, um, Lynn would just walk into the court and go and sit in the dock or something or sit with his team. But as soon as she showed up for his evidence, he would deliberately sit midway through the court, together with his wife, until the jury filed into the room and then he would get up on the stand, you know. He repeated that in the second trial and there was, yeah, there, there was a funny, I thought it was funny mm. because he tried to do that the first time the jury were brought in and his wife was there during the retrial. But the judge called him up before any of the jury saw him, so it didn't kind of work, if you like. Yeah. But then after the break, he made a big show of um, calling Breed up to give him a bottle of water on the stand. And of course, the jury watched her walk up and walk back. But he had a jug of water and a glass of water in front of him that mm. he never touched. So I think it was just a show to, you know, to He's show her off. He's always day. playing games or always trying to outsmart everybody else. And yeah. um, how did he react to the guilty verdicts? Um, I haven't spoken to him since. Better conditions in Irish prisons. Yeah, I'm sure he's doing better in, 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 in an Irish prison than, than in... Do you know what prison he's in? He, he, was, he was in, he was on a rand in, in, in a waiting sentence in Clover Hill first. I think he was subsequently in Mount Joy. I don't know if he's still in Mount Joy anymore. Um, so I, I can't answer that strictly. Um, how did he react? I think, I mean, interesting, you could, I was standing at the back of the court because I wanted to see his reaction and Breed's reaction when, the, when he was found guilty. Her shoulders shook and she kind of cried a bit, but he was just stone cold, um, zero emotion showed, um, head dropped, mm. you know. Um, then, of course, the, the, as soon as the as guilty verdict was read out, the prison guard approached um, to escort him away and straight away Lynn was back into schmooze mode, you know, just asking the prison guard, hang on there, buddy, wait a second, I just want to say goodbye to the wife, you know, and he clicked back into, uh, mm. you know, I can deal with anything mode. Now the raids on, on their home in Wicklow and on another number of properties, including one where a Bulgarian gentleman was mm. staying, happened after he was jailed. Yeah, so the guards had launched a money laundering investigation during the trial. Um, I mean, amazingly enough, I think. Mm. They launched that because they discovered the house he was living in was owned and connected to to the companies being run by the Bulgarian. Um, in January, while Lynn was awaiting sentencing, they raided Lynn's home. Um, a fairly substantial enough raid. I mean, I I watched it happen from from a hill nearby. I don't have a huge amount of experience of watching these things, but um, it was a... There was a lot of people, uh, yeah. There was a lot of people. There was a dog A lot van. of documents taken. There was a lot of documents. They took a car. 
they seized uh, computer devices, mobile phones, etc. Um, they subsc- simultaneously raided another four properties in, in Meath and Dublin at the same time, mm. one of which was the home of the, the Bulgarian individual. The Bulgarian guy refused to provide passwords for his his electronic uh, equipment, his computers, his phones. So he was he was brought away and arrested. Um, he's subsequently been charged with failing to cooperate and refusing to provide that that information. Um, and that investigation continues. Um, at Lynn's sentencing, the guards at the end indicated to the judge that they wanted a, a hearing date for a confiscation of assets um, application. That's set for the 16th, which is next week. Yeah. We don't know what assets the guards mean or what they're they're looking for in that application. They've already seized uh, close to €3 million Euro in the accounts of the companies associated with, with, with those raids. So that, that's gone. Um, it could be that they're going after the house that Lynn is living in or Breed Murphy and the four kids are now living in, but we won't find out until... Until, the until they and if they do list the the assets that they're looking for, so I suppose look what a fascinating story and the book is fabulous because you bring us with you on your investigations and there's that insight into um, into that end of things and how you mm. discover and find and I suppose the tension and the excitement when you do see him and all the rest of it. Um, but I wanted to ask you finally, what about the bigger family, like this ordinary family he came from and. Have they shown support to him? Yes. Um, in a practical way, when he was first extradited in March 2018, it was his sister Anne who provided a hundred thousand euro um surety, surety to get him out of that Brazilian jail. Well to on bail. To get him on bail here, yeah. Oh bail here, yeah. Um Subsequently, another sister stepped in and provided that instead. So he's back since 2018. He was extradited in 2018. And he was put into custody initially on a flight risk and then he got bail and COVID. He was was denied bail for six or seven months. He was in Cover Hill. Um, He successfully got bail after a while. Then, of course, COVID happened. It delayed everything. But also, he was intent and he told me he was intent as soon as he came back to delay things as much as possible and string it out. Why? Well... I think Lynn's approach to this whole saga Kick from the along. moment he was arrested in Brazil is to delay and... That's the lawyer in him. It's the lawyer in him, I guess, yeah. Um, Kick it along. And, he, and God knows what'll happen. He's delusional as well, right? Mm. I, I don't think I've said that yet, but he's delusional. He feels he has, he's he been wrongly accused and uh, he doesn't believe he's guilty of... He doesn't theft. believe he's done anything wrong? Believe, he's a strange guy. He's, he's willing to admit that He's willing to stand up in court and openly admit that he's bribed bankers and engaged in corruption mm. in order to drag them into his his, his 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 dirty net. But he's not willing to admit that he's a thief and he still doesn't admit that he's a thief. So he's appealing. And he couldn't be charged, of course, with bribery or with... One of the things he succeeded in doing while resisting extradition in Brazil was to have the original charges reduced. So he was originally not charged only with theft, which is what he's convicted of now. He was also charged with um, fraud and use of a false instrument Elements of of Irish law that aren't reciprocated in Brazilian law, so they have to be dropped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a fascinating, I mean, tale, and it seems like there's more chapters to come with them. Yeah, I don't think it's finished. Um, Can you estimate how much Lynn has cost the state so far? I mean, two court cases, free legal aid. Free legal aid. You're talking about months on each of those cases. I've never put an estimate on it. I've seen someone do it. It's hundreds of thousands for sure. Millions. You know, it, it could easily run into millions. Um, the legal team in the retrial, 10,000 a day. Wouldn't be unusual. Mm. Um, the documents in the case, the preparatory work that had to be done, a million plus documents, um, endless discovery applications, often just to delay things more. Um, but for all the 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 cuteness and the cleverness and all the rest of it and the ability to con people. They sort of like the idea of living in that house valued at 450,000 mortgage free, Mm. refurbished before they went into it Mm. on social welfare and the way they were living. That's not rocket science to look at that, is it? What do you mean? And that we could establish... Like as an investigator, like if you're trying to establish, are these people broke and social welfare 
Mm. Um, like it's, it's not rocket science to, to prove that aside from social welfare and disability, which is also one, mm. and legal aid, uh, he... Like his involvement had, He had with, control of other monies, right? That's yeah. not rocket science to establish, and that's what the guards are doing now. Yeah. Um, I, I think they've been quite foolish, to be frank with you, in the way that they've used the same people who were associated with... Yeah, that's with kind of what I mean. And even, even, even the house is... For people who are broke, a 450 grand mortgage-free house that has been refurbished is a little bit too much of a stretch for people who are broke. Well, they would say they're only paying rent, you know. Well, you see, they're probably used to living in phenomenal properties for the last 20 years anyway, and maybe anything less would seem too little. Yeah, I mean, look, they would say they're paying rent, and that's the defence they will yeah. they will use. Um it's the job of the guards now to link yes. those assets together and show that actually the rent is a charade and really, you know, there's a lot more. But even so far being linked with people who were there in his past business dealings. Yeah, I don't understand. That seems foolish to me, to be honest mm, with you. If mm. I wanted to do what he's done, yeah. what he might be doing, mm. I wouldn't have used people. I could link back on company documents to breed mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the money trails going way back. So it's a little bit puzzling why he's done that. Um, does he think he has a backstory that can fill in that gap? Uh, we'll find out soon, mm. you know. But, yeah, he uh, seems to be a gift that always gives in one way from a journalistic point of view. What about the documentary? When are you likely to have that completed? Um, so we've been commissioned by, by RTE. We're doing a, a two-hour, um, two-part document. Two one hours, yeah. Two one hours, yeah, on, on, on the whole saga. It's to air end of this year, beginning of next year. What a well worthwhile story, as is the book. Um, Fugitive, Michael O'Farrell, the Michael Lynn story. Now that was, we're talking nearly 20 years in the making. Do you know what I mean? That's what that is. Sure, That's yeah. your work going back. And, and you know, this isn't something that you, you took the subject matter and tried to put it together in a year. It is, you're there, you're part of the story as such. I think, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a story I wanted to tell. There was a point came along when he was arrested in, in 2013 in Brazil. I just knew because of what I knew about the story that I had to tell it. I didn't think I did this book deal 10 years ago. I thought it would be done in a year. Didn't think I'd be sitting here after another 10 years, you know, with the book only out now. Um, I also think it's maybe interesting to see a little bit into the world of a journalist. I mean, that's part of this as well, you know. Mm. I think, um, I think we're struggling in this business maybe to fund journalism properly. And I think long form journalism like that uh, should be funded properly. I agree totally with that. I mean, it is a problem going yeah. forward. Um, you know, there are certain topics that require investment into journalism to get each little piece of the jigsaw. There's a public service. And I don't want to sound prudish, but there's mm. a public service to to a lot of journalism, not all of it, right? But there is a public benefit to the work a lot of journalists do. And uh, that is certainly being eroded in recent times. Mm. And um, I hope that a book like that can show how a long form um, piece of journalism can actually benefit uh, our knowledge of what happens in the world and not just be a piece of titillating uh, entertainment. Too. Mm. No, for sure. Well, Michael O'Farrell, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.